Okay, so today is Thursday, October 22nd, 2020, less than two weeks before the whole world is going to change. <laughs> um, and what I wanted to go over today, uh, I'm going to put this in a constant contact, but I thought we might come up with some bullet points by asking what information would be helpful. And so what I've got is just what events are coming up. So weekly, uh, of course, we have our nerd meeting. And then Bethany, she is the um, Nevada and the Arizona rep. She covers those two states. And she is presenting on the new immunity products. And she's going to do that on a weekly basis. So she was just inviting people that want to jump on to that, then she would present. Um, and then, of course, our weekly meeting is open. And I, I haven't really opened that up to the other reps on a weekly basis, um, just inviting them on our monthly guest speaker. But I would say our nerd meeting is focused on Texas and Idaho's inner circle of elite practitioners who share their microbiome experiences every week. And then once a month, we try to have a guest speaker. Then tomorrow is the clinical grand rounds. And its topic is on pediatric mental health. We see that the topic has disappeared. So I'll need to add that back in. Um, and these clinical grand rounds are really to have an experience in different clinical settings. So regardless, you know, of this specialty, um, whether it's pediatrics or gastroenterology or um, psychology, it's it's going to change each month and you get a different perspective into a different type of microbiome. Um, so that is the whole purpose of the clinical grand rounds. And what they're offering is when apparently they, they pre-record the grand rounds and then they do the Q and A a week following and it's live and they offer discounts for participating in the q a so um, this friday it'll be a 10 percent discount and you can take that discount off of anything in your cart and you have a week to use it so that is the advantage of participating in these month participating in these monthly grand rounds and then um, next month, of course, that's when we are doing our BiomFX with Lacey on our regular scheduled nerd meeting on Thursdays, Thursday. And then next month is also the microbiome keynote symposium, the 13th to the 15th. And I was going to list some of those bullet points that go along with that. And I think, um, the key thing in the keynote meeting is that, you know, like our nerd meeting is the inner circle for Texas and Idaho. The keynotes meeting is the inner circle of the company for microbiome labs. And um, I think, you know, those that are early adapters and uh, they tend to have you know, the most, you know, cutting edge information, their practices are going to be so much, so much further ahead because they're getting information direct as, whoops, somebody else is coming in. I have to keep remembering to look at my screen. Hello, Laura, welcome to the meeting. So I am recording this so that anything that was missed, I can send the recording to catch up. So 
Okay, so as I was saying on the keynotes meeting, the idea is that that is the inner circle for those who are making gut health really the focus of their practice. And uh, most of us now recognize that everything starts in the gut. And if you're going to improve a patient's outcome, no matter what the symptoms are, what the disease condition is, the gut is always a central part of that. So I think those companies that focus on gut, and then of course, all of those practitioners that are using our products as their primary gut focus uh, in their protocols, then the keynote symposium would be very helpful. Okay, so I will finish these bullet points on each of those meetings that are coming up and outline the discounts that are available uh, for especially the one tomorrow. And um, there's been some other meetings that were, and I apologize for that. You know, when I hear about them last minute, um, I try to get them out to some key individuals that I know could benefit from them. And the Pam Smith um, meeting, I found out about it, you know, the day that I sent it out. And I, I feel bad about that. So, because it doesn't give a person much of a chance to rearrange their schedule. And there's so many webinars going on now because of, of COVID that it's really difficult to juggle our schedules to try to bring them all in and still earn a living, you know, still see patients, still, you know, talk to our customers. So, um, okay, so now I'm going to open up the floor. Um, that was really all the announcements I wanted to make. I just wanted to, you know, get your input if there were additional bullet points that you would like to see or you have questions about any of these events that are coming up. And then if there are specific protocol and case study questions, we'll definitely have some time to go over that. So let's open the floor. Anything you would like more information on as far as meetings and webinars that are coming up? So far, so good. It, it makes sense to me. Okay, super. Now, um, I did want to remind you that I'm trying to gather questions for Lacey when we do our November 5th. I'd like to give her an idea of, uh, you know, most of the people joining us for that nerd meeting on BiomeFX have had a BiomeFX uh, result back. And this Q&A is going to be more for an advanced session, as in um, things that you didn't get complete answers for, or you got just additional answers or questions that you want answers to, or you are um, looking forward to doing another BiomeFX with the BiomeFX 2.0 and want to know some of the new modules that are available. So if you have those questions, let's email them to me so I can get them to Lacey and we can structure that Q&A. So I will add that information to the constant contact I'm going to send out. So I am recording this so that if you want to, uh, you know, get a recording just to know we're talking about the different webinars, symposiums, discounts that are coming up and how to tap into those. 
and I'm going to send a constant contact with some more bullet points so that you have a better idea of um, the key dates, times, discounts, and links. Has anyone had any interesting um, product questions or protocol outcomes? I still get almost daily, I get the question about uh, is there dairy and corn in our prebiotic? And it's, it's unfortunate that the label says there is when the fact is there isn't. Um, you know, this is really where the FDA, you know, is making a requirement without uh, detail in that requirement that people understand you can have a highly refined molecule from a food substance without having any of the immunoreactive protein existing in that ingredient. It's much the same as um, if you look at how many products are derived from soy, for instance. Um, you know, vitamin E is derived from soy, CoQ10 is derived from soy, and in small print on the label of those products somewhere it says contains soy or derived from soy, but most people don't even see that. You know, they're so used to taking vitamin E or, or CoQ10, and it's very highly refined, and there are no soy reactions to that. Um, and if there is, it's very, very, very rare. So that's the similar situation as the, the prebiotic. So, you know, I find myself just explaining to practitioners so that they can explain to their patients that even sensitive people that are sensitive to corn and dairy product, as in milk, can still consume this product. Has anyone had to explain that to their patients? Did it go over well? Did the patient um, try it and have a good outcome? Or have you had anyone that just read the label and decided they aren't going to try it? Because you'll have some individuals that- I have one case. Go ahead. What I was gonna say is I have one case that um, they, are, they are allergic or, or sensitive to mm -hmm. corn and they were hesitating about it. And when I told them about it, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it, it's not going to have that type of reaction, then they were okay with it. Super. And they've been using the product with no problem? Uh, I think so. Uh, I need to confirm that. It's a family of several kids and it was one of the kids. Okay. Super. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, it's just important to, you know, hear, hear it over and over. Yes. You know, I like to, you know, hear people that have confirmed corn and milk allergies and that they use the product and they have no problem. Um, you know, I hear that, but I just like to keep, keep confirming that with people and let other people hear it from different sources so that you feel comfortable and you can relay that to your patients. And that's part of having this forum. Personally, for me, dairy is sensitive, and I can eat the prebiotic just fine, as Super. well as the mega mucosa. Perfect. Perfect. And that's you know, part of the reason the forum is important, that it's one thing to hear references from a company. It's another to hear it from the representative, but it's a whole nother level to hear it from your peers, from other practitioners, 
it's a, a higher level of credibility that is, I believe, very important. And if anyone, you know, if I'm yammering on and someone else sees on the screen, I'm not sure if you can see when people are waiting in the waiting room and need to be admitted, but if you can, please don't hesitate to draw my attention to it. I would hate to have someone trying to get into our meeting and not able to because I am distracted <laughs> or I'm yammering on and not watching the screen. So, okay, so good, good points there on individual ingredients about the products. Um, I like to keep everyone, you know, up to date on, you know, new products that we had, new products that we're thinking about, issues that we're having, breakthroughs that we're having. That's part of, you know, the pearls that are important when we're, you know, trying to get to this, this level of information. Um, I think earlier this morning, I got a question about MegaGuard. And the question is on um, the licorice component. In, in some, you've probably heard from other companies or you've read some literature that you have to be careful of licorice, that there is a component in licorice that may cause contraindications. Um, usually it's mentioned that licorice can uh, raise your blood pressure. Now that is highly dependent on the type of licorice that is being used and uh, you know if it's deglycerinated or not, but it also has a lot to do with uh, the type of flavonoids that are used. So you can have a glycerinated licorice with high flavonoids and not have that effect on the blood pressure. Now there was another question about um, does licorice have a contraindication with cortical steroids? Uh, that one I have presented to the Zendesk, which is our new system of uh, our internal forum of asking questions. My guess is that the same answer is going to come back that it's highly dependent on the type of licorice that you have in how many cured, how many flavonoids uh, what type of flavonoids and um, you know how that presents you know in the biochemistry in the mechanism so uh, i'm like i said i'm waiting for the answer to confirm that but i would say that ours would have no contraindication with the corticosteroids or with blood pressure medication. So, um, you know, stay tuned on the confirmation for that. But those are the type of questions I think that are really important. This new system, the Zendesk, is collecting all of these questions from all the practitioners that are coming through the representatives uh, throughout the country and basically putting it into a giant database. And that will be a very valuable resource in terms of, uh, it, it will be online. You'll be able to just put in a, a subject on any of the products and see what questions have been asked and then it will be um, searchable. So that will be you know, very handy tool to have. So we're working on that. It's, it's in the process now. So I just encourage you that any of those biochemistry or mechanism questions, you know, send my way and um, I will, you know, get those, you know, let you know what I know about it, but also I'm turning those into the Zen desk so that they can be part of that giant database. Any other K2 
cases, protocols, product, meeting, testing. Hi, hi Tracy, it's Laura. Hey, Laura. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you fine. Okay, I just wanted to tell you about a new patient. Um, I have a young man, you know, early 30s, who's been dealing with ulcerative colitis for about six years. Mm -hmm. um, finally connected with us. We've known each other for a long time, but he finally connected and I put him on the mega IgG and within a week he said he noticed improvements. Wonderful. He's been on Remicade and all kinds of other infusions and stuff and I'm hoping we can get him off all that mess. <laughs> Exactly. And when you have a case like ulcerative colitis, when they have such dramatic symptoms, it is so exciting when they can get, you know, such relief and um, you, you really get a true believer. And those are the folks that, you know, that spread the word about your practice and, and help you. Yeah, he said um, he doesn't care how much it costs. He'll probably stay on the rest of his life if he has to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, if, you know, if anyone has, you know, had ty any type of bowel issues and, and symptoms, it is um, so disheartening, you know, to... Miserable. In miserable, yes, that it's a small price to pay to have control of your life again. Yeah. I'm excited to be able to help him. Excellent. Well, I love making my practitioners heroes and heroines of their patients. I have some questions. Hey there, Sheila, how are you? Good, I had a hard time getting on. <laughs> the, oh. the link that was sent for the Zoom kept saying either you were, I was waiting for you, waiting for you to, um, to open up the meeting and then when I closed that and went onto another link, it said you had a meeting going on but it wouldn't let me in and then I finally, scrolled down on the calendar thing and found another meeting link. So mm -hmm. it was confusing. Anyways, I'm um, sorry. I, I, that's okay. I think it's Zoom. I think Zoom is kind of crazy right now. Um, I did the, I was on Megaspore for like a year and, um, and then I added the prebiotics for a couple of months and it actually improved bowel movements. Mm -hmm. um, and then I uh, started the, the megamucosa and I started getting bloaty. Um, so I backed off the megamucosa and then eventually I had to just back off all of it. I couldn't stay on um, the prebiotic anymore and the uh, megaspore. So I'm down like to meg taking megaspore like once, once or twice a week. And I, um, but I, during that time I was also, I did my biome FX and the, um, it's like I, my ratios are really out of whack and there's like non-detectables of this, non-detectables of that. I'd have to show you the, I guess my report, but I'm just, just curious after being on my uh, Megaspore for so long and then adding the prebiotics, would it have been um, the yeast problem that I have that would have kept it from effectively, you know, remodulating the gut? Because there is, um, I was also on a FDN call with Kat Steven Simmons. Um, she was teaching us how to look at the biome FX. And one of the phylum, um, when, if it's really high, it, it could indicate a candida problem. So I was just wondering if maybe that's why I didn't see success in getting things more modulated. Or is there like more of a diet thing that I have to look at? No, I... I think when we were kind of discovering 
how the onion is peeled when it's you know looking at the whole microbiome and that yeast and and we we've read into this before how yeast can create a mucus layer that coats the the intestine and it's on mm -hmm. top of the mucin layer and so you've got now this barrier that you you can get a certain amount of progress but then you have something that comes in and either um you know strips away this mucus layer and it's the first time a lot of your gut has ever seen the megaspore because it wasn't able to get you know physically get to some areas and now it, it feels like you're backtracking so is that like a biofilm then yes in a oh, okay the the concept is the same um it's a if there was a word for you know a a community or a large you know you know usually we think a biofilm is is just a small enclosed um area where the bacteria or you know whatever the organism is is walled off but when you have a mucus area that's a large mm -hmm. almost like say it's somebody's swimming pool you know you've got this this community oh, okay. got you know a barrier of, of um, watery mucus stuff almost like a um, a wall it's walled it off from a whole section of of the colon or a whole section of the intestine and then when that section is now being chipped away um, the immune cells of the gut you know for the first time are encountering the other side of the wall that they hadn't seen before so we have to think about this environment uh, in a dynamic situation of how is it changing as well you know if if you have say it's east berlin you know it's before the wall came down um you know now we have a whole community that we hadn't gotten to before and needs to be revitalized and stimulated and and resources and built up um so we you know we've worked on half of the city now we've got the whole other side to do so you know maybe there's some better analogies out there but if we can okay. you know figure out a way to describe what the symptom you know how we're seeing the symptoms change when sometimes it looks like we're making progress and then all of a sudden you know what's changed now we can't even tolerate megaspore every day so there's got to be something in the community that's that's a way to describe what that change looks like okay now it's interesting too because i did an organic acid test and i have four markers showing yeast fungal um candida problems and i have one c diff marker and it it kind of correlates with the biome effects as well so it's it's cool to see those correlations yeah um, yeah no, so, we know. so are you saying that i should continue with oh go on well i was i was going to go on about the way candida is able to um, dig in to hibernate it goes through different phases of uh, when it multiplies um and the way the hypha kind of dig in and then how if you think you've removed the yeast if there's you know um you know some of the hypha that was left behind now it's able to start budding um after the main body of the organism has been removed so it's it's difficult let's just you know to put it mildly um and i think you know we're going to need some strategies uh, to really understand have we knocked the yeast back enough to make some inroads in the, the whole ecology of the microbiome okay so it's like the dandelion yes <laughs> of, the, of our garden 
that yes. the yeast bug. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And when you've got okay. a dandelion that's just blowing in the wind, you know, how, how do you control that? You know, it's, if you're trying to do things naturally, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough one. Well, even when you, you cut the dandelion down, it just grows back up. And if lets you get all that root out, it'll mm -hmm. just keep growing mm -hmm. and, and budding, you know, coming back up. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So would you suggest then that I maybe back off and, or just keep, what would, what would your suggestion be? Should I add the mega Michael balance at this point and, and um, keep doing the mega spore and the prebiotic, but maybe at a smaller level or? Yeah. What I've, you know, found is the pulsing of those two different protocols because you, most people uh, cannot tolerate the die-off of megaspore titration at the same time they're dealing with the megamicrobalance die-off. So I would, you know, hammer at the yeast for a month and then um, give that a rest, go back to the total gut restoration and see how far I can titrate that up, how far I can, you know, uh, progress and then um, when I get pushed back there, then go back and hammer the yeast some more. Um, I think right now, because what we're, we're trying to do is um, outsmart these very, you know, intelligent organisms that are adapting to and trying to get around our strategies. So it's like we have to shuck and jive and mm. stick and bag um, to you know, outsmart them. So it, it, it's a battle strategy. Okay. Okay. I feel more hopeful now because I was like, oh, because feeling bloaty is just no fun. <laughs> no, so, no. Okay. I will start doing that then. Yeah. And, you know, and is the mega mic balance enough? Oh, well, I was, I was going to say, you know, HU58 if you know the the bloat doesn't go away um and you've got hu58 i would switch from megaspore start back with hu58 and work that up you know to the restore flora and then go back to to megaspore you know um, so that you're getting the okay. benefits that the hu58 can offer but it's not going to bloat you. At least I haven't seen anybody that HU58 bloats. So. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Great. And that should also help with the C. diff situation as well, right? The HU58? Yes, yes. Because you can work that up at a higher number faster than you can Megaspore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And that, the other question I have is on the Biome FX. Um, it shows three different pathogens, C. diff, E. coli, and something Wadsworthy something. Um, but it's showing my percentile is like either below the, the RA or slightly within it. So, but the fact that it shows up means something. <laughs> I, I still need to take care of it, address it, or? Um, um, what's the, the percentile is below the, R, the RA, what is that? Um, the, re, uh, let me look or, up the term or, again. <laughs> or is it um, the range? Something abundance. Yeah, it's, um, hang on, I will look it up again. Oh, is this? The relative abundance, the relative abundance of the art, that's what the RA is. And so um, I had three um, that were noticed and they were, one being the C. diff, but they were, they were below or within the relative abundance, but it's still being noticed as, you know, here's something going on and I don't know um, hmm. 
why, and I, I, I had my first appointment to talk about this with somebody. Um, they never showed up. So oh, probably because something's going on in their life. So no problem. I just rescheduled for, for uh, next week. So. Okay. Well, yeah, because if it doesn't get answered, um, you know, if you didn't have that scheduled next week, I would say definitely submit that question so that I can get it to Lacey and she can address it in the November 5th seminar because some of the terms in the new biome effects um, are are new to me because uh, they've changed the the report slightly so um, that would be good to bring that up because I I am not sure what what okay. that means relative abundance and you know some of these questions I don't know if there's if there's good answers for um, like, you know, you say you have, you've detected a pathogen, um, but what if there's a combination of pathogens and the combination is worse, worse than a high number of any one of them? You know, I, I don't know if they, they know that answer. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, do these organisms, you know, you know, because we know C. diff has a toxin associated with it. Um, do these others have toxins that the combined effect of the toxins are, you know, it's not one plus one is two, it's one plus one is five. You know, what what do some of the combinations right. mean? So I don't know, I don't think we know that yet. I think that's still being learned. Yeah, well, one of the things in my FDN group that we've noticed is that usually when somebody has H. pylori, there's usually blasto is, is there too, blasto hominis or whatever it's called. Um, usually that's there too. So that's mm -hmm. what they've noticed. Um, and and I, I actually, um, years ago when I was treated for H. pylori, I it showed up on my test too that I had both of them going on at the same time. So there yeah. is a little correlation there. Yeah, and I've heard practitioners talk about, you know, candida having concomitant viral infections that typically you'll see in, in really bad systemic candida, you know, be sure and be on the look for EBV and CMV. Um, and the rationale is that candida lowers your immune system defenses, and that's how those viruses you know, kind of squeak in there. I heard the same thing, you know, for years, you know, when Ken was working with Lyme patients, there were always, he would look for, you know, EBV, um, HSV, CMV, and there almost always was one that was taking over, um, you know, like an opportunistic, you know, pathogenic response. So um, I think the combinations uh, exist and they they are opportunistic. They look for a, an opportunity when they, your defenses are down, you know, to move on in. Yes, yes. I have a quick question with all of this. Sure. So the big idea then is not to kill one or something, right? It's just to put it into levels that the rest of the microbiome can uh, control in a sense. And then if a big bully gets in town, then a whole bunch of other bad guys come in town at the same time. And you can go after the bad guys, but until you get the bully under control, the rest of the bad guys, or if you get the bully under control, the rest of the bad guys will go into non-existence or lower levels again. Would all that be sort of correct in analogy form? Yes, yes. And because very often these criminals, they're lurking around in society and they don't do a whole lot. They're not able to there's too many good guys in their way but if something happens to the good guys and 
the criminals get together, or like you said, a bully comes on the scene, that's when they're able to start, you know, robbing the stores and beating up the citizens. So, but just having them there isn't the threat until the good guys aren't able to defend. And that's why we're always Perfect, really, thanks. you know, pressing the information or, or promoting that we've got to make sure the keystone strains are well fed, have a good foothold in the community because that's the long-term protection. That's how the person, how every individual will maintain optimal health is because of the abundance strength and diversity of the keystone strains. Otherwise, they are going to be forced to be on gut health protocols for the rest of their life. And that would really depress your patients knowing that it's never going to end. You know, they're looking at you to come up with a plan that they can wrap their mind around at a defined, you know, you know, three, six, nine months, something, so that they know it's not forever. So if there's like some of my um, other BiomeFX reports that came in, like there's, there's no detectable Bacillus longum or some other ones that should be there, by doing this protocol, it should start increasing those numbers. It should become detectable once again. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So most people have an inoculation, the seed of which will be in the appendix or in another area. If a person has had their appendix removed, the body finds a place to pocket these, the, the seeds of these, this initial inoculum. And they're just really just waiting there uh, until they get some encouragement. Um, it would be very rare for someone to absolutely not have any traceable amounts of, of some of these keystone strains. Um, so what we're trying to do is just give them that jump start and that encouragement. So a question that pops into my mind is if somebody was only nursed like a month to three months, that's still a good enough because nursing also helps set up that environment, right? Absolutely. But what about a child who's um, been C-section where they're not even able to go through the vaginal canal and then the mom couldn't nurse them because she was too frazzled? Yeah, so... The ones that are born C-section and bottle fed, um, they're going to be, it's going to be a lot harder to nurture and, and bring back those keystone strains. And there still is an opportunity to bring some, you may not be able to bring all of them. So they, the strategy at that point is to bring back as many, to br increase the population of as many as you can. Um, but Mm -hmm. Even with the, the C-section and the bottle fed, uh, we've seen that you are able to bring back some. Okay. That's good news. But this is a great area of research right now. A lot of studies to find out, you know, exactly how compromised are some of the, these individuals and um, how much benefit changing the birthing technique. Um, because we, we recognize that we've become too sterile in our hospital environments. The hospital environment in itself is weighing in on the microbiome and uh, how can we make a healthier you know, birthing experience. And that's one of the reasons, you know, the whole interest in the, the vaginal lube, uh, the vaginal microbiome, because it is 
the inoculation that is going to affect the next generation. So it, it needs to be an environment that is as healthy as possible. And when the data came out that the typical vaginal lube that ob gins and gynecologists are using in some women are affecting that environment um, sometimes permanently was very alarming and that's why micro you know we've invested in uh, a lube we pulled back the launch of that they had some issues because of the color of it or the smell of it or, or whatever and that's one one lube you don't want to have a color or a smell and um so they've reformulated that and they are planning to relaunch it or actually have the launch uh, you know pass the beta test but because it is important and um, you'll hear more about that next month nice Okay. And they're finally learning that the appendix is necessary. So I hope they, <laughs> I hope they start trying to give people the right scenario when appendicitis pops up. <laughs> exactly. I mean, all of these, you know, what they thought before were just what God made a, you know, a useless organ. I don't think so. You know, the, the tonsils are important, the appendix, it's important. You know, all of these, um, I, you know, I remember early on consulting women um, that would come in and, and some of the things they told me that their gynecologist would say, like, oh, you don't need that plumbing anymore, just, just yank it out. Well, it's supporting organs. You know, you don't just take things out because they're not being used, they have a purpose. So, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we're quickly approaching the top of the hour. Is there any other burning questions? Nope, thank you very much. Super, super. Well, Maybe thank this one is quick. I'll okay. Ask. If someone is using MegaGuard in an H. pylori protocol, would the amounts be similar to the you know bottle recommended amount, or do we make that a little higher? Um, you can do a loading dose especially if someone is having a lot of symptoms. So the product is designed for all the upper digestive issues, many of which are you know, GERD, dyspepsia, reflux. And if someone is refluxing at every meal, it's fine to take MegaGuard at each meal. The, the point of MegaGuard though is to start improving that the pH barrier, improving the environment so that those symptoms will resolve. So it's not meant to be, you know, double the dose or, you know, for, for long-term. The only long-term situation that may arise is if someone does not have a gallbladder and they're using MegaGuard to control the flow of their bile. Okay. Interesting. And so does MegaGuard go in and uh, kill some of the H. pylori or does it just modulate the pH so that H. pylori doesn't, can't thrive? It does both. So it's modulating, modulating the pH, oh. which is going to discourage H. pylori, but also the gut guard, which is a registered trademarked licorice, has been shown to stop the protein synthesis of H. pylori. So it is actually working to decrease the number of the organism. Okay. 
That's good to know because there's one other product that I've used for H. pylori that was patented and it has the licorice in it, but it has some other things too, but it is a very good product. Mm -hmm. So good, good to know. Yeah. yeah, some of these registered herbs, yeah. uh, they're registered because they are used as um, behind the counter formulas in Europe in, in some country and that's why they've registered it. Okay. Super. Well, those are some great questions and I'm so glad you joined me to ask them and share your expertise and your and to learn from each other. So uh, yes, until next week, you know, please join us and reach out in between time if I can help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care.